Khan's grandson and successor died in 1307, and during the coming years, the Chinese population pushed the Mongols back into the steppes. The great Mongol tribes who had developed the court of Kublai Khan were now once again simply a nomadic tribal people. Ironically, even as Marco Polo's travels would motivate explorers to try to head to China for lucrative trade, the Ming dynasty that followed was not interested in trade and contact with the West. China began to isolate itself, and merchants no longer travelled freely along the Silk Road. While a few travellers visited China, no one could repeat or replicate Marco's experience. 119 early manuscripts of the travels of Marco Polo survive, but only a few circulated in Venice. Nobles, scholars, and monks were the first readers of the text, but many who could not read may have also learned of Marco's travels orally. The travels may have been translated into Tuscan within just years of its writing. A Dominican monk, Francesco Pipino, translated the text into Latin between 1310 and 1314. His translation edited the text for a religious audience, removing sexual references and providing the travels of Marco Polo with a distinctly Christian perspective. It later appeared in German, English, Catalan, Aragonese, Venetian, Latin, and even Gaelic. Circulation increased after the invention of the movable printing press. The first printed text appeared in 1477 in Germany, followed by another German edition four years later. Pipino's Latin translation provided the basis for a French translation in the 16th century. Even as Marco Polo's account began the process of making its way across Europe, the Venetians widely considered him a fiction writer at best by the end of his life, and that perception continued into the 14th century. Even translators believed the stories to be fictional, because other adventure and travel stories, like that of John Mandeville, were pure fiction. Mandeville simply combined stories, often relying upon ancient sources, and he had not travelled on his own. Mandeville's account of his imagined travels was more popular than Marco Polo's for many years, and the two were frequently grouped together, even though the travels includes Marco's personal observations, noting plants, animals, and people that he personally saw. In the text, he insists that he was present at certain times and places. While descriptions of his own experiences can mostly be considered truthful, he also includes other information that he certainly believed to be true, including second-hand information, local mythology, and his own opinions. The role he played in the Mongol court enabled him to provide observations about the character and personality of the ruler Kublai Khan. To understand why so many thought Marco Polo had written fiction, it's necessary to keep in mind that he was not only trying to create a factual account, but an imaginative and exciting text describing his travels and journeys. While aspects of the travels of Marco Polo seemed factual, or at least reflected Marco's own perceptions and experiences, Rusty Kello added a number of stories to the travels that frequently drew upon Christian miracles and were unrelated to Mongol, Chinese, or Indian culture. Marco Polo also continued the belief that a hidden Christian kingdom, led by a ruler named Prester John, existed somewhere to the east, perhaps in India. Marco Polo did include a number of second-hand accounts in the travels, some of which are clearly noted as such, and others are not. He records details of the battle in Japan and the Japanese people, though he did not visit Japan personally. His knowledge of the battle was purely second-hand. He described Madagascar, but did not claim to have visited the island, and after recounting his own stay in Zanzibar, he shared what he knew of Ethiopia, but did not visit the region himself. Marco also wrote of the islands of male and female on his visit to India. According to him, the men and women of these two islands only spend a few months together each year. The remainder of the year, men remain on the island of male, and women on the island of female. 
He described the women as devoted mothers focused on raising their children, and girls remained with their mothers while boys were raised as children on the island of female. The island of Malaku remains largely matriarchal and may have provided the basis for Marco's description of female. Marco Polo also likely exaggerated the role he, his father and uncle, played in the government of Kublai Khan, and he almost certainly did so at some points in his account. He described them playing a vital role in the Battle of Xiangyang, but the Polos were not present in China at the time of the siege and could not have assisted during the siege. Marco also claimed to have been governor of Yuan Zhong, but contemporary sources do not support this assertion. He did claim to have worked for Kublai Khan as a young man, but contemporary accounts offer that Kublai Khan routinely employed young men of all nationalities. The three certainly served in diplomatic and administrative roles during their stay. Regardless of how his contemporaries treated his account, Marco Polo's work played a crucial role for subsequent explorers. Since Marco frequently discussed distances between places he travelled, navigators and cartographers used his account to help them broaden the scope of their maps and learn more about the geography of the world. His account directly inspired Fra Mauro's map of the known world in the 15th century, and in 1492 Columbus carried a copy of the travels of Marco Polo on his journeys to the New World. He hoped to find China and its rich trade goods, including spices that Marco mentioned in his accounts of India. This edition exists today and is heavily annotated in his own hand. A later Venetian explorer, Antonio Pigafetta, circumnavigated the globe and wrote his own account of his voyage, inspired by Polo's writing. Portions of Marco's book were integrated into other travel and adventure stories, including Percas, his pilgrimage. These excerpts inspired well-known works, including Samuel Coleridge's Kubla Khan. By the 17th century, Marco Polo was much more well-regarded and often referred to as the one who discovered new countries. He appeared in an ecclesiastical history of Venice late in the 17th century, and during the early 19th century, Marco Polo's accounts were recognized as fundamentally factual. Scholars compared the travels of Marco Polo to annals of the Mongol and Chinese courts, and found clear similarities in the depiction of court rituals, merchant practices, and religion. Large annotated editions of the travels appeared and became popular in the 19th century. Interest in Marco Polo's travels, as a relatively accurate reflection of his experiences, continued throughout much of the 20th century, and a longer version of the text was discovered in the 1920s, and translated in 1938. This new translation more accurately captured Marco's enthusiasm and his voice than earlier translations. Today, only a few modern scholars have questioned his account altogether. In the 1990s, Francis Wood produced an article analyzing the validity of Polo's account and concluded that Marco did not cross Constantinople, pointing out that there are various ambiguities in his reconstruction of the areas he travelled, and the route itself. Wood thought it would have been impossible to take a caravan to cross the Taklamakan Desert to Central Asia, and she cast doubt on the Antarctic stages after Dunhuang. Wood also made the following key argument. If Marco Polo was, as he claims, an important person, why is his name absent from official Chinese and Mongolian archives, administrative documents, personal diaries, and the accounts of his contemporaries? Marco Polo no doubt exaggerated the importance of his office and embellished the facts in his favor, but this should not have been enough to explain the absence of any mention of his name. It remains strange that not a single missionary or even a merchant coming from Europe ever said a word about his presence, even though Marco Polo claimed to have travelled the length and breadth of China. Her arguments included Marco Polo's failure to mention the Great Wall of China, 
but the Great Wall was not mentioned in Chinese chronicles until 1579 and was built during the Ming Dynasty, sometime between 1368 and 1644. Marco Polo did not mention the Great Wall because it did not exist as people recognize it today during his time in China. Any evidence of the earliest efforts at a Great Wall would have been relatively minimal during his years in China. His lack of knowledge regarding tea and chopsticks are also noted as possible discrepancies, but Marco functioned primarily within Mongol society. His understanding of Chinese society was limited by his lack of exposure to it, which may explain why he didn't mention the traditional practice of foot-binding or the drinking of tea. While Marco Polo's account is not purely factual, most historians today believe it provided a rare and contemporary window into the culture of the Mongol Empire, and its intrigue led Marco to adopt some of that culture himself over the course of his life. Just as importantly, the travels opened up an unknown world to readers and helped spur further European exploration. Of that there can be no doubt. The Leper's Plot of 1321 During the Middle Ages, the human body was seen as sinful and perishable, and diseases were sources of great fear, as people across the world lacked protection against both common diseases and deadly epidemics. Several medical records from the time indicate that people often suffered from fevers, toothaches, insomnia, neck pain, heart pain, bone pain, scabies, malaria, ringing in the ears, deafness, jaundice, sunstroke, and more. Smallpox, which they fought with some success, caused somewhat greater anxiety, while leprosy, an infectious and incurable disease from which death was slow and transmitted by direct contact, was also a great danger. Throughout that time, patients were often isolated and lived on charity. Aside from the plague, leprosy was arguably the worst disease of the Middle Ages. Its visible consequences caused fear and loathing, and it was separated from other diseases by the religious and social stigma to which infected individuals were exposed. It was generally considered that the patients had sinned grievously, and that sometimes the terrible disfigurement of their appearance caused by leprosy was an eloquent external sign of their life in opposition to the principles of Christian morality. From the 12th century, by the decision of the Third Lateran Council, lepers were excluded from the community, deprived of all their civil rights, and cast into the social margins. But at the same time, the lepers got their own churches, parsonages, and worship services. The canonical regulations established the indissolubility of marriage, which was an obvious improvement, because in the early Middle Ages, the illness of one spouse was a valid reason for the annulment of the marriage bond, as shown by the conclusion of the Church Council in Compiègne, France, in 757. The law of the Lombardian king Rothari from 643 prescribed that a leper may be thrown out of the house and treated like a dead man. In later periods, the exclusion of lepers from society was carried out according to a special ceremony, they were given the last anointing, and sometimes a memorial service was read if the patient had already died. The year 1321 is perhaps the only one in history where the sick, infected, and deformed collectively organized to take over their world, or so it was claimed. It was believed that the lepers had been planning for two whole years, not only their rebellion, but also a world after it. They planned who would get what and how they would get it. They would simultaneously infect wells, streams, and fountains with poison consisting of a mixture of their urine, blood, four types of herbs, and the consecrated body. All of those in France who were not lepers would thus die or become lepers themselves. The healthy who would survive the rebellion of the sick, now sick themselves, would become citizens of the kingdom of the sick. 
Ultimately, the lepers never ruled the world because their supposed conspiracy was discovered and the lepers were arrested, beaten, burned, tortured and imprisoned. But that didn't stop the leprosy panic from spreading across Europe. One of the main sources for the lepers' plot was Bernard Gouy, an inquisitor at Toulouse between 1307 and 1324, who wrote, There was detected and prevented an evil plan of the lepers against the healthy persons in the kingdom of France. Indeed, plotting against the safety of the people, these persons, unhealthy in body and insane in mind, had arranged to infect the waters of the rivers and fountains and wells everywhere by placing poison and infected matter in them and by mixing into the water prepared powders so that healthy men drinking from them or using the water thus infected would become lepers or die or almost die and thus the numbers of the lepers would be increased and the healthy decreased and what seems incredible to say they aspired to the lordship of towns and castles and had already divided among themselves the lordship of places and given themselves the name of potentate count or baron in various lands if what they planned should come about king sancho of majorca mentioned the supposed plot in a letter to king james of aragon in june of that year know also lord that lepers have been captured in avignon and subjected to torture and it is said that they have confessed that they were to poison all the waters of wells and fountains that were outside of houses and that this is to be presumed it has already been decreed in avignon that no one should use water from outside fountains and it is said that jews consented to all this we are notifying your serenity of this so that you may take precautions that from this or similar deeds no harm come to your people as that letter indicates interestingly but perhaps not surprisingly Jews in central France were accused of inciting lepers to poison the city's wells, sometimes at the behest of the Muslim rulers of Granada and Tunisia. During the Middle Ages, in most European countries, restrictive laws were applied against the Jews, which, among other things, ordered them to wear special symbols to distinguish them from Christians. The most common mark was a circle, yellow or red and white and men had to cover their heads with a specifically pointed cap with a ball on top. In this way, the pre-existing idea of an internal enemy, accomplice, and instrument of an external enemy led to a terrible execution that was the first of its kind in European history. A search of chronicles, confessions forced by torture, and deliberately falsified evidence leads to the conclusion that those two conspiracies were boiled in France at that time by the laity and the church authorities, one against the lepers and the other, right after it, against the Jews. After burning at the stake and other massacres, the lepers were separated and the Jews were expelled. Both measures were advocated a few months before the discovery of the alleged conspiracy in a letter addressed to Francis King Philip V by a consul of the governorship of Carcassonne. It was only after the murder of about 5,000 Jews that King Philip V recognized their innocence. As for anti-Semitism in Spain, it would arguably not reach full boil for another 150 years culminating in the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella issuing an expulsion of all Jews from Spain shortly after taking back the rest of the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors. Ailstones in Sweden Ailstones is a megalithic monument located in the Skane area in the south of Sweden, and it is the largest of its kind in the country. Fifty-nine massive stone boulders are arranged in the shape of a ship about 200 feet long, and the monument is believed to have been built by warrior seafarers who used bullocks, slaves, ropes, sledges, wooden shovels, and simple steel tools to collect and lift the boulders. 
Most researchers believe this 1,400-year-old structure is a funerary monument built for one of the chieftains of that era. According to local legend, the stone ship was built for the mythical King Ael, who rests beneath the monument. King Ael the Strong, Heims Kringler, or Ole, according to Scandinavian legends, belonged to the house of Skjorden, and he was the son of King Fridlif of Denmark. He fought several battles against King Aun in Uppsala, and he ruled Uppsala for twenty-five years until he was killed by Starkad. According to legends, King El was difficult to kill because his sight could frighten anyone. The Swedish hero Stargard managed to cover Ael's face, and only then could he kill him. Starkard was rewarded in gold, but regretted his crime. These megaliths, some of which weigh up to nearly two tons, have a similar cut to those found in locations around the world which date back to the Stone Age. That raises the question of whether these stones were stolen from even older monuments. Ships were an important part of the life of the nautical culture of Sweden, and it is no wonder that they built stone tombs for important people. Similar stone ships have been found in Germany and the Baltic states, although they are typical of Scandinavia. The original fate of ale stones still causes controversy among historians and archaeologists, because it is widely believed that the stones are a kind of sundial. Their positioning results in the fact that the sunlight on June the 21st and December the 22nd passes exactly over the tops of the rocks that are farthest from the back and front of the stone boat. Another theory is that this is the burial place of another leader, and some even point to Olaf Tryggvason, a Viking chief who died around the year 1000 and is said to have rested on this rock with his ship for centuries. Another legend says this is a symbolic monument to the Vikings who died in overseas conquests. Maybe there is truth in each of these stories. Bonfires often appear on the rock at night. Swedes, although generally sceptical of the supernatural, often claim that the bonfires are probably burned by Viking spirits, especially on April the 30th, Walpurgis night, when the arrival of spring is welcomed around the country with songs around the fire, and the ones on the rocks look amazing. In the morning after Walpurgis night, it is necessary to collect the dew in bottles on the stone because it is believed to be an excellent medicine for all diseases. A valuable talisman that protects against evil forces is said to be the ashes taken from the fire that burned that night. In 2006, archaeologists used magnetic sensors and radar to map the terrain under the area and found a larger circular structure over 500 feet in diameter with a 65 by 25 foot rectangle at its heart. Furthermore, during excavation, they discovered the footprints of giant boulders that had been removed long ago. Although the team did not find a skeleton, the prints suggested that the site contained a Neolithic burial chamber called a dolmen. Several upright stones with a horizontal stone on top in which the body would be placed. Based on their appearance, the dolmens may be up to 5,500 years old, possibly older than Stonehenge, and the large burial chamber probably belonged to a local chief or clan head during the Neolithic. As there was very little evidence from the outer ring, researchers are not yet sure what it was used for or whether it is as old as the dolmen. The Celestial Phenomenon over Nuremberg The theory that we are not alone in the universe has been fueled by countless sightings of unidentified flying objects for decades. The excitement that they are strange beings, who are like us or not, and who live somewhere in the infinite span of the universe, has been shaped by the human imagination and placed among one of the greatest mysteries of our time. Many sightings of alleged flying saucers have turned out to be simply misidentifications of terrestrial or astronomical objects, such as weather balloons, Venus, 
light reflections from clouds or fog, sudden flashes of light, flocks of geese, or swarms of insects reflecting light, oval cloud shapes, traces of airplane flights, low-flying planes, and meteors. There are people who assume that every real flying saucer and UFO is an alien space vehicle. But what if some of them are extraordinary living beings that originate from our planet and which science has not yet discovered? In the 16th century, artists depicted news in engravings, just as photographs are now documented in newspapers. And one of the earliest documented examples of aerial phenomena was an unusual vision on April the 4th, 1561, in Nuremberg, Germany. The unusual celestial spectacle over Nuremberg in 1561 was recorded by the printer Hans Glaser, with a picture and description on a coloured leaflet, with the following inscription. In the morning of April the 14th, 1561, at daybreak, between 4 and 5 a.m., a dreadful apparition occurred on the sun, and then this was seen in Nuremberg in the city, before the gates and in the country, by many men and women. At first there appeared in the middle of the sun two blood-red semicircular arcs, just like the moon in its last quarter, and in the sun, above and below and on both sides, the colour was blood. There stood a round ball of partly dull, partly black ferrous colour. Likewise, there stood on both sides, and as a torus about the sun, such blood-red ones, and other balls in large numbers, about three in a line, and four in a square, also some alone. In between these globes there were visible a few blood-red crosses, between which there were blood-red strips, becoming thicker to the rear, and in the front, malleable like the rods of reed grass, which were intermingled, among them two big rods, one on the right, the other to the left, and within the small and big rods there were three, also four, and more globes. These all started a fight among themselves, so that the globes, which were first in the sun, flew out to the one standing on both sides, Thereafter, the globes standing outside the sun, in the small and large rods, flew into the sun. Besides, the globes flew back and forth among themselves, and fought vehemently with each other for over an hour. And when the conflict in and again out of the sun was most intense, they became fatigued to such an extent that they all, as said, fell from the sun down upon the earth, as if they all burned and they then wasted away on the earth with immense smoke. After all this there was something like a black spear, very long and thick, sighted. The shaft pointed to the east, the point pointed west. Whatever such signs mean, God alone knows. Although we have seen, shortly one after the other, many kinds of signs in heaven which are sent to us by the Almighty God to bring us to repentance, we still are, unfortunately, so ungrateful that we despise such high signs and miracles of God, or we speak of them with ridicule and discard them to the wind, in order that God may send us a frightening punishment on account of our ungratefulness. After all, the God-fearing will by no means discard these signs, but will take it to heart as a warning their merciful Father in heaven will mend their lives and faithfully beg God that he may avert his wrath, including the well-deserved punishment on us, so that we may temporarily here and perpetually there live as his children. For it may God grant us his help. Amen. By Hans Glaser, Letter Painter of Nuremberg Scientists have not yet solved the mystery of the celestial phenomenon that took place on the morning of April the 14th. The 1561 Nuremberg Flyer shows and describes a supposed celestial phenomenon in front of the rising sun where a multitude of cross-shaped, round, and cylindrical objects battled each other in the sky. The event was discussed by meteorologists, historians, and ufologists who showed special interest because, according to them, a perfect description of the celestial battle between several UFOs was given. 
In contrast, meteorologists believe that the description is an artistic rendering of a natural phenomenon known as a halo. According to eyewitnesses' descriptions, unknown round, cylindrical, and cross-shaped objects of red, blue, and black were seen that morning, and they performed maneuvers in the sky that resembled a mutual fight. Some objects were then seen falling far beyond the horizon. The woodcut shows two people who witnessed the event, as hundreds of bright objects of unusual shapes filled the sky. The engraving also shows that where some objects fell to the ground, columns of smoke rose. This vision began at dawn, when dozens or hundreds of crosses, glowing balls and pipes fought each other over the city, and it was over in an hour. Many objects flew into the sun, and several others crashed to the ground and disappeared in a thick cloud of smoke. This diverse collection of objects did not remain static or move in one direction, as observers said that these things in the air fought with each other. Many of these objects were described as falling towards the ground, and then distributed between a pair of contrails. How is it possible that different people from different places could notice such an unusual sight in the sky? Did it happen, or was it some kind of mass hysteria? If the witnesses were separated at a distance, it is unlikely that it was some kind of mass hysteria or suggestion. And even more, why should these things fight with each other? Historians assume that Glass's account is a mixture of several historical and natural events that occurred independently of time, which he heard from others, and embellished with religious interpretations and warnings, namely, during the 15th century, and especially the 16th century, descriptions such as miracles and heavenly phenomena were widely distributed and popular. At the same time, however, for centuries, people have tried to interpret what happened. What is true in the description of Glasser, and what is invented? What lies on the surface is an undeniable religious connotation, especially in the closing lines. He directly says that this phenomenon is God's call to repentance, which led many scientists to think that Hans Glasser had greatly embellished a real rare astronomical phenomenon and used it as a form of religious propaganda. But here's the interesting thing. The event in Nuremberg was not unique. It is interesting to compare this event with the event that took place in Basel, Switzerland, on August the 7th, 1566, at dawn, when many citizens of Basel watched in awe as an hours-long aerial battle between black spheres covered their city sky. Considering that this event happened only a few years after Nuremberg, it is impossible not to establish a connection because part of the description is very similar. Trying to understand the secrets of the incidents that happened, scientists first study the biography of Hans Glasser and what else he wrote about. Glasser turned out to be a publisher with a rather dubious reputation. Many of his graphics belonged, as it turned out, to other authors who worked in Nuremberg. In 1558, Glasser even received a warning from the city council for illegal activities. After that, he was banned from publishing. Glasser loved sensational stories and had a pasha for exaggeration. Many of his engravings mention very strange atmospheric phenomena, such as bloody rain or bearded grapes. However, there is some truth in his reports because the things he described have completely understandable scientific explanations. Blood rain has been documented since the time of Homer's Iliad, and raindrops sometimes appear blood-red due to the presence of dust particles or algae spores, as was the case in India in 2015. Bearded grapes are a phenomenon that causes mold feeding on the constantly wet conditions during harvest. Of course, it is unfair to single out Hans Glasser as a sensation. Many medieval paintings depict incredible celestial events that are interpreted as signs from God, and many of these events were completely natural atmospheric phenomena. But this in no way negates their divine origin. 
scientists unequivocally attribute the extraordinary celestial battle in the sky over Nuremberg in 1561 to rare weather conditions, including meteor showers, circular horizontal arcs, solar pillars, and halos. That was Ancient and Medieval Conspiracy Theories, The History of the World's Most Persistent Conspiracy Theories, written by Charles River Editors, narrated by Michelle Humphreys.